Today we light the first candle of the Advent. Each candle has a meaning. This first candle is the Our help and our shield. Let us pray. Eternal God, as we await the coming of our Savior, give us the courage to hope. Give us grace to see your plans of redemption for our lives, for this community, and for the world. Through Jesus Christ, the source of our redemption and hope. Amen. Thank you. Welcome to all of you this morning. Uh, are there any announcements that we need to make? Um, so for those of you who are interested in like putting some Christmas decor up in this room, it's going to come out on Thursday at 6.30. And anybody who wants to come, we're going to see what we can do. Uh, we don't know if we're going to be able to do the whole like, Join me, please, in the call to worship. The Lord is getting us ready to receive a gift of great joy. Be vigilant and ready, for the gift is about to come. The promise of God is faithful and trustworthy. Watch, wait, the gift is coming into the world. Great be to God for such lavish love.
times we think of confession because of an action that we've done or not done. Uh, like I swore or I said something bad to people or I took something that didn't belong to me. But it's more than just an action. It's an attitude. Whenever we put ourselves first, whenever we don't think of talking with the Lord God or bringing Him with us or acknowledging him. Uh, that is also separating ourselves from God. And we're celebrating the Advent, that Christ is coming, so that we might have abundant life. Therefore, let us confess our sins together. God of amazing gifts, we are rushing headlong into this season of pride, giving, greed, and struggle. We want to think of the holiday as delightful, but we have a tendency to make it a time of the hardest stress. We overschedule our time, overdraw our resources, ignore those moments in which we could just relax and have a quiet time with our families and viewers. We blame it on everything else but our own. Scripture says if we say we have no sin, we only deceive ourselves. In fact, the Lord Josh said the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, for that is our peace, that is our strength, that is our life. Listen to the good news of Jesus Christ. He came to us to die for us, to pay the ransom, to set us free. Through Jesus Christ, I declare to you, you are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. <laughs>
Hosanna now through Advent With loving hearts we sing For Jesus Christ is coming To be His children's King Hosanna, blessed Jesus, come in our hearts to dwell, and let our lives and voices praise and glory tell. Hosanna, let this welcome ring out from every heart. Draw near to us, O Jesus, and evermore depart. So when we see Save us from our sins. That pretty well sums it up perfectly. <laughs> because there was something that was oppressing us. We felt guilty. We felt we knew things were not right. And he came that we might have life. Life in him. Life through him. And so it is a marvelous story. In fact, the message we're going to have in a little bit talks about a much bigger story that God is what God is doing in our lives. And it's very, very special. He came to set us free from our sin and to God. Let's bow in <coughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for this gift you've given to us of Jesus Christ. It's the reason we give gifts to one another. It is the reason we celebrate in song and so many special things. And so be with us, guiding us, working in our attitude as well as our actions, that we might honor and glorify you, not only in this season, but forevermore. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.
recently is now coming to shingles. <laughs> for anybody who's sick right now, Julie. Heather's having a tr real struggle again right now with her unending pain. It just escalated a bit right now. For Heather, an escalated pain. Um, for the transition of our government, our president. That may go smoothly. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you call us to come to you and present the concerns and the needs as well as the joys of our lives. <laughs> it has been a difficult year for the coronavirus and the not being able to embrace one another, greet one another at family gatherings like we usually do. All kinds of things have been difficult, including the loss of jobs, the workers on the front lines, the exhaustion, the resources. We pray that all this may be lifted, but we might also lift up to you our praise and thanksgiving. We recognize again that you are all-powerful. You draw us back to you one way or another. We pray for those families who have lost loved ones. How grieved and difficult that is. We pray for those who continue to struggle for food, for meaningful work, for getting through things like the flu or the shingles for Mary Ann. We pray for those who are sick and it's a hard time, especially with the hospitals cutting back and treating those essential. We pray for the transition of our president that we might truly come together and celebrate and rejoice that you have given us so much in this country of America. We pray especially for those who are in pain. Pray for Heather as she goes through this time. Give her a strength that is far beyond her own strength as you work in her. We thank you, Lord, for the, the many things, the thanksgiving times, the opportunities you give to us to be together. And we thank you for that. We thank you for the friends and the brothers and sisters you've given to us to support and encourage one another. Be with us, Lord, as we go through this busy season that we may truly honor you in all that we say and all that we do. For we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together and to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For I is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Our Heavenly Father, you have given us your word, and it cannot be broken. We give you thanks for the scriptures, and pray that we might have ears to hear what you have to tell us today. <coughs> Let your spirit be in each of us as we celebrate the words that you give. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The scripture is from Ephesians chapter 1. The Apostle Paul, as you know, he went around to many different cities and taught and uh, set up pastors and elders in different towns. In Ephesus, he was there for three years, and so he really got to know the people and really <laughs> did a great job. And now he's writing a letter to them, uh, and it is obvious that it's to believers, because in the first verse he says, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. So he's writing to believers. And he wants them to know what God has done and is doing. And it's as relevant today as it was then. Listen carefully to the words, verses 3 through 12. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he proposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be to the praise of his glory. May God allow us to not just wrestle with it and hear it, but take it with us where we go. <coughs> Do you know that a duck attaches itself to the first thing it sees after it is born? Most of the time, it's the, the mother duck. <laughs> but if there happens to be a collie dog just watching all this going on, and the hatchling, the new duck, sees the collie dog, the, the duck will try and follow the collie dog wherever he goes. <laughs> that duck has an identity problem. <laughs> It's called imprinting, I am printing, imprinting, taking on characteristics of what is around it. But the duck is not the only animal with this problem. I don't know if you've ever read the books or seen the movies about Jungle uh, Book or Jungle Boy or Mowgli, then you would know about this. In the past 250 years, there have been 53 documented cases 
of a child being lost in the wild and surviving because it was taken care of by wild animals, such as um, wolves, bears, antelope, monkeys, even pigs. <laughs> These are all imprinting, taking on the character of what is around them. It might surprise you then that we, and it happens to all of us, as well. To examine our present environment, we have to understand the terrible consequences of the fall of mankind with its devastating effects upon the entire human race. So we go back to Adam and Eve in the garden. You've read it, Genesis chapter 2, how God sets Adam in the garden to take care of it. And he says, all of the trees in the garden, all of the fruit of the trees in the garden are yours to eat, except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For if you eat that, the fruit of that tree, you will certainly die. God went on to create Eve then, and then in Genesis chapter 3, sometime later, the serpent, the most cunning animal of all, baits the woman into saying, he said to her, did God say you may eat of all the trees in the garden? And she responds, he said, you shall eat of all the trees from the tree fruit of the trees in the garden, except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For if you eat of that fruit, you will certainly die. And then the serpent, you will not die. Mm. You will be, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. Sometime later, we don't know, that Adam and Eve were examining the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they it looked all right, it didn't look threatening, and so they ate it. And immediately they hid themselves from God, for they saw and recognized that they were naked. And God came and said, Where are you? And, and said, Did, Have you eaten from the tree, fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they passed it on to the next person, saying, he, she, that serpent. Uh, Adam and Eve responded, they did die spiritually. They hid from God's holiness and perfection. That relationship with God was broken between God and human. Adam was our representative, and that broken relationship remained for all humans who came after Adam. It is part of our human nature to want to be God. I come first. I, my wants, my needs my desire. It is part of human nature to want to be God. It is so deeply ingrained in us that the Bible says that we are all born flawed with sin, separated from God. Now that doesn't mean we can't do good. We can do good. But it does mean that we can't help doing bad choosing ourselves with, over God. But it goes much further than that. The carnal mind, that means a mind without God in it, is darkened and deceived, even denying the very existence of Almighty God. God, through the prophet Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 17, 9, 
said, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. People in sin are always fooling themselves and cannot help it because the heart is deceived, twisted, perverted, rationalizing away our sin, delighting in their sins, and even trying to get other people involved in their sins, thinking that if enough people will do what I have been doing, even though the Bible says it's wrong, then it, it will be a lot more acceptable to our, in our society. The heart is desperately wicked, going so far as hating God and denying the existence of God. If we want to be God, we want to put God down or there, say that there is no other God. If you don't believe me, look at what people have tried to do with creation. In my own generation, it was the idea of uh, the Big Bang Theory. You know, there was this great big something and filled with gases and suddenly there was a spark and it just exploded and it created all of the stars and all of the planets around the stars and all of the moons around the planets. <coughs> I don't know of a single scientist that believes that today. And there's so much <laughs> wrong with that. But it was a way of just doing, describing what happened, how it started without putting God in it. Or maybe before my time, the word evolution is probably still in some of the textbooks. Um, but most scientists have said there are just so many holes in that. <laughs> People, it's not, it's not scientific at all. Again, people trying to talk about how we began without God's creation. We are all born separated from God. Our imprint is that we have grown up in a fallen world and the attitude, habits, and values of this world around us we have tended to embrace try as hard as we can, we cannot correct our own situation. Then we meet Jesus and experience his love and sacrifice for us and his teaching. And we begin to see something greater than we've ever seen. God who came to correct our nature. That correction requires a very radical change. Jesus says that it is so radical, it is like a new birth. You must have a new birth. First, Second Corinthians 5.17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. As we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we become a child of God to live in this world by faith, trusting Jesus. We are now learning to live with God's nature within us. We have died to the human nature and we are alive to God's given nature. We rejoice in this and give thanks for this amazing gift of Jesus Christ for us. But we are not taken out of this world, this fallen world. The world, the flesh, and the devil play on our old ways of thinking, trying to deceive us, to act like who we were before we took on the new nature in Christ trying to hold us back from living this new life in Jesus Christ. We were like ducks. <laughs> uh, 
acting like colleagues, waiting uh, until we realize our true God-given nature, and with God's promises now becoming who God intended us to be. This is exciting, and it's confusing, isn't it? The Bible says we are now in Christ. Everything that is Jesus Christ is now ours as well, forever. His holiness, his righteousness, also goodness, power, wealth, all of that are ours. But we don't feel holy, do we? Or righteous, right living. We don't feel like we have the robe of righteousness on us in God, from God's eyes. Because we still do ugly and stupid things. Sometimes we don't turn away from the wrong. We do it anyway. It's not unusual to Christians to feel like, I must be, there must be something wrong with me. Why do I keep doing this? This negative feeling creeps in upon us. We struggle to overcome the negative imprinting of this fallen world and to practice God's new nature. What we have failed to comprehend is that once we have accepted Christ's offer of salvation, our identity no longer depends upon ourselves. It depends upon Jesus Christ, who is faithful. Jesus said, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you, John 15, 19. We are secure in Christ. He will not let us go. Our identity, our new life, is in Christ. We are learning to walk with him and take on the priorities of his kingdom. Like a baby learning to walk, we will fall down many, many times and get back up again and keep trying until little by little we are li living more and more in him, in his righteousness. We are growing in maturity in Christ. Instead of putting ourselves down, we lift up thanksgiving to God for such amazing gift that he has given to us of new life. As we realize our situation, we don't beat ourselves up because we have failed or fallen. Rather, we run back to Jesus Christ, confessing our failures, receiving his forgiveness, and get back to envisioning and living our identity with him and in him. In our scripture this morning, Ephesians 1, 3 through 12, 10 simple verses. He talks about before the world ever began. Well, listen to the scriptures again. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. You are blessed with every spiritual blessing. Verse 4, he chose us in him before the foundations of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. You are holy. You are blameless. Verse 5, he destined us in love to be his sons and daughters through Jesus Christ. He adopted you into his family with all of the rights of being in that family. And he did it in love through Jesus Christ so that you might have the truth.
true identity. Verse 6. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he freely bestowed upon us. You have received his glorious grace. Though you don't deserve it, though I don't deserve it, he gives it to us anyway. Verse 7. In him we have redemption. That is a word used in, in the idea of slavery. When a person was being sold, and then someone bought that person, uh, they, they redeemed them, they set them, and they could do what they wanted. They could set them free if they wanted. And that is exactly what Christ did. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. You have been redeemed. Your sins are forgiven. Your past guilt and regret is gone. Verse 9, he made known to us the mystery of his will. He just, he doesn't just guide us each day and lead us each day. But he also reveals the knowledge of his whole plan from before the world was ever created. How he chose us to trying in the Old Testament as he tried to show how God could oh, I had so much there. God could uh, take a, a nobody, a one person, and then begin to, because of his faith, and passing it on. I'm choosing a small, tiny, insignificant nation, a nobody but showing that with God's presence <coughs> what they could do. To the New Testament, to the coming of Jesus Christ, to the teaching of Jesus Christ. And if we continue in Ephesus, we begin to realize even when Christ comes again and, and brings uh, the believers to be with him in heaven, we not only have this his guidance daily, but we have the whole plan of God before us. To verse 10, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. All things will come together in Christ. Verse 12, we who first hoped in Christ have been destined and appointed to live for the purpose of his glory. Living for the purpose of his glory. Everything God asks of us is for God's glory and for our own good. You and I are in the world, but we are not of the world. We find our deepest and most enduring joy and happiness in Christ. He has created us in his image and has allowed us to be born again, to live in Him. He is not only our Lord and Savior, but also our friend and family. Our identity lies not in this fallen world, nor in the perfection or, or the good that we can do, but God has declared that we are now His children daring to accept his promises and his riches with God-given worth, loved beyond measure, serving him with great joy in this world, and headed to an eternal glory as we live as new creatures in Christ. Our identity is secure in Christ. And that is how we choose to live. Thanks be to God. Let's bow in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your word. We give you that you've opened our minds from before the world began to even where we are now, believers in Christ. We give you thanks for your living presence, for your Holy Spirit at work in us. We give you thanks that you are leading us 
first of all, freeing us from the values of this world and to be able to live in all the spiritual blessings, every spiritual blessing in heaven. We give you thanks, Heavenly Father, and pray that we may take to heart this amazing gift you have given to us. For we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah.